on Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1. Streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. You're listening to The Jam Price Show, and my guest today is Eddie Muller, who is the host of Noir Alley on Turner Classic Movies. And today we're going to be talking about his Noir City Film Festival. Welcome to the show, Eddie. Thank you, Jan. It's great to be here. It's Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. How and why did you start Noir City Film Festival? Uh, well, it was shameless self-promotion at first because I was promoting a book, a, a book that I had written on film noir. And uh, initially, I started doing this 21 years ago now uh, in Los Angeles at the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. But then a, a couple of years later, I was invited to do it in San Francisco at the Castro Theater. And uh, it, it was just spectacular. It was like lightning in a bottle. And the audiences were fantastic from the very beginning. And that's a big house, 1,400 seats. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to say that they have remained uh, loyal ever since. And we're, we're like moving into a new generation audience, which is really fun because it's been 17 years. And so I, I still have the loyalists who were there from the beginning. And now I'm seeing a lot of people who were maybe five or six years old when we started. And now they're coming to see uh, movies, as I say, the way they were meant to be seen up on the big screen. I couldn't agree with you more. I say that all the time. I preach that on this show constantly, how movies need to be seen in the movie theaters. It's just a wholly different experience, especially uh, these older movies, the film noir movies, you know, the, the black and white. You've really got to see the texture and the color and, and just the photography is just so amazing. So I'm so happy that you are bringing this back. But I, I was I was going to ask you, what is the age range of the people that come to your film festival? It's fantastic. It is. It is vast. Uh, just the other day, I did. I, every year now, I do a Christmas show to sort of get people in the mood and and uh, let them know that the festival is coming up in January. And we do like a one night thing. And I showed uh, the Night of the Hunter. You probably know oh, that yes. film with Robert Mitchum that yes. Charles Lawton directed. Uh, and it was incredible to me because there were obviously people there who saw the movie when it first came out, uh, but there were quite a few young people there. And I always ask. For from the stage beforehand, you know, how many people have not seen this movie before? And I would say that almost 70% of the audience had not seen the film before. And and to me, that's just spectacular because it shows that we're doing the right thing, you know? And, and for these people to see a movie like that, which has all those qualities you just mentioned, the spectacular cinematography, it's, seeing it on a big screen is a totally different experience. For them to see the movie for the first time that way, I, I they were all people were coming up to me afterwards saying that was incredible. I've never seen a movie like that, which in the case of that film is absolutely true because there really isn't another movie quite like that. No, there isn't. Uh, so, yes, the age range is incredible and and it's a gender split, I would say, 50-50, male and female, and uh, it's, yeah, I'm amazed. And people now come, it's become a destination event, so people come from overseas to the festival, they come from all around the United States, it's uh, uh, it, it really is something special. It, it sort of took me by surprise how popular it's become. That's amazing, Eddie, that it's grown so much over the years. Uh, what can people expect when they attend the film festival? Well, they, lo they know that I go out of my way to find the best possible print. In most cases, we, we want to show 35 millimeter prints. We want to show the film. Uh, in some cases now, you're not going to be able to get film on some titles. Uh, there are certain studios that have sort of committed to digitizing their libraries. And if they're going to spend that money on preserving stuff digitally, they want you to show it digitally, which is okay as long as they do it well and, and they take care with the films. So there's that. They get to see everything's going to look really good up on the screen. I, I know when I was a kid and I went to rep houses to get my cinema education, a lot of times they were showing what, what's known in the business as a circulation print. And those are just constantly in motion and they get shipped all around and they get pretty beat up. So you could see things that are a lot of scratch, you know, a lot of scratches or there may be pieces missing <laughs> the film or something. Uh, we don't do that. Everything that we show is like an archival print that is in really glorious condition. Uh, so there's that. That's the main event. But then um, I think what people love is the sense of community because all the people who come to this festival are there for the movies. They love the movies. They know it's not a trendy 
thing to go and see these films. So the other people who are there to watch them uh, are of a like mind. And so a lot, I have seen a lot of lasting friendships uh, begin at this festival. I've even uh, performed a few uh, marriages. Wow. Where, where I, have, I have been the officiant for couples who have met at the festival. And they say, well, you know, Eddie, you kind of brought us together, so we'd like it if you were the officiant at our wedding, which I, which cracks me up because I'm like, you know, all my movies are about husbands and wives who, like, want to bump each other off. You do get that, right? <laughs> so I don't know if I'm the best omen to have as the officiant at your wedding. Uh, yes, but you uh, but had... I'm happy to say that all of those unions that I have presided over, are they're still together. That's that's great. <laughs> and we must say you, had a, you have a lot long, happy marriage yourself, so. <laughs> I do, I do. I go, uh, yes, I'm in my uh, 34th year. It'll be, uh, uh, this year will be my 34th anniversary. Congratulations on that. So I guess the movies she, haven't she rubbed can, off. She can take a lot of punishment. <laughs> <laughs> so but mostly it's just me talking. You know? <laughs> People well, say, what does your husband do for a living? She says, he talks. He, you know, that's what he does. So she must that's be a good listener. Whether he's getting paid for it or not. He, <laughs> he must be. She is a good listener then. She, she, she deserves an award. <laughs> so she is, It's interesting you say that, Jan. She is not a big movie fan. You're kidding. You know? No, she's not, not really. I mean, she's a much more practical, down-to-earth person. She's a businesswoman. She has her own company. She, you know, and, and movies to her are just like, a, you know, something to kill time. You know, and it, and of course they've become my whole vocation, right? Right. So right. She, she's always amused by that, or bemused by that, <laughs> one or the other. But she loved Night of the Hunter. She had never seen the Night of the Hunter, and so she went to the movies the other night, and she was just like blown away by it. She loved it. Well, it's a movie you can definitely be blown away by. There's no question about that. And to see that on the big screen, I can only imagine what an incredible experience that must have been. Let's talk a little bit about your foundation. Let's segue. You brought up restoration. Uh, tell us a little bit about your foundation. And also, 100% of the proceeds from this film festival goes towards restoring films. Do so you want to talk a little bit more about that? Correct. Uh, well, when I started doing these festivals, one of my goals was to show... Um, you know, obscure films, movies that I had, in my research for my books, movies that I had found mostly uh, like old VHS copies that people had taped off television decades ago, right? And that's what I was looking at. But when I had the opportunity to create a film festival, I wanted to show these movies and went looking for prints of the films only to discover that a lot of them uh, had, you know, ceased to exist. I mean, you couldn't find the print. So after a few years and seeing how enthusiastic the audiences were for these films, I said, you know, what if we did, what if we started a nonprofit foundation where the proceeds from the festival actually went to finding and restoring films that were otherwise missing? And that's what we have been doing for uh, 12 years now. And, and it has worked spectacularly well. It's a, it's a nice little closed loop ecosystem. So when people come to the festivals, and we don't just do it in San Francisco and LA, I have uh, eight festivals around the country now. And all of the proceeds, as you said, uh, go to restoring films. And so every year I try to restore at least one film, which I will premiere at the festival in San Francisco. This, this year we're doing a film from 1949 called Trapped with Lloyd Bridges and Barbara Payton. It was a real B movie, but um, directed by Richard Fleischer, who would go on to become a very well-known A-list filmmaker in Hollywood. Uh, but this movie was made by Eagle Lion Pictures, which was a, a short-lived company in Hollywood, and, and no one was there to protect um, you know, their, their library of titles. So a lot of them have vanished, but we were able to find one single print of trapped. Uh, it took years to do it, but we finally found that one print. And from that, we were able to create a, a restoration. And, and what that entails is making a new negative from the existing material so that the film will never be lost because you can always strike another print once you have created a new negative. Um, so that's what we do. And we've done this now for, we've probably restored 10 or 12 
titles and preserved, which is where you're not making a new negative, but you are uh, creating a new archival print from the existing material, um, which it would be a negative. And so we've pro- probably overall we've we've restored or preserved thirty titles since we've been doing this. Wow. I think we started in 2006. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. The hot, you said you found uh, a, a, a very rare f- uh, print of this movie. How did you find it if there was only one out there? Well, you you get to know everybody at the archives, and there are film archives. There aren't many of them, so it's not, like, impossible. But truly, Jan... Movies show up in people's closets in uh, when when uh, film laboratories go out of business and they have stuff in the back that's been sitting there for years and years. They will give the stuff to a film archive like the UCLA Film and Television Archive or the Harvard Film Archive, uh, whose charter is essentially to take the film regardless of what it is. Because the, their their mission is to preserve as much as they possibly can. So fortunately, when we started asking about Trapped a few years ago, we couldn't find a print. But you keep asking. Every year you just have to go back and do it again because something may have turned up in the meantime. And sure enough, there was a collector in New York City who I don't, I'm not entirely sure how he came into possession of the film, but he had a 35 millimeter print of Trapped that was in really excellent condition, uh, which was great for us because we had been toying with the idea of trying to restore that film digitally from a 16 millimeter print, and that w- and the quality would have been nowhere near as good as what we ended up with because we found this this actual original 35 millimeter. Uh-huh. So it it happens in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes you will find it. You also have to know the foreign title of all of these movies. You have to know the titles in different Mm -hmm. countries because you may find the film in an archive overseas, but it's not going to be known by its American title overseas. So you have to know, if you're asking in France, you have to know what the French title was of the movie. And, And they may have it. So... It's it's great fun. It's like my own little personal detective story. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we want you to we want you to hunt down this film, Mr. Muller, and uh, and that's how it works. So if you get the French version of it, then is it been dubbed or is it got subtitles? Well, you hope not. You hope that what you can get is the original material that they shipped to France, where then a laboratory in France put the subtitles on the film. Or, or dubbed the film, and you, and if you can get the original elements that they worked with before they made the print that had the new soundtrack or had the titles, then you've got something that you can work with. Do you have a list, uh, like a wish list of movies that you haven't been able to find that you, you said every year you keep asking, so do you have a, a whole big list of films that you ask about every year until you find them? Yes, it, it. there's actually a few things that happen. Number one is there is a wish list, that, and I'm happy to say we've accomplished some of our biggest wishes, like Woman on the Run and Too Late for Tears and The Prowler. These were all films that we really wanted to to restore, and we were able to find them. Then in the course of, of doing this, because it's now been 10 or 12 years, there are also films that weren't lost when you started, but then you realize they weren't being taken perfect care of, and so they deteriorate to where it's not screenable. You can't show the film. So, like, The Man Who Cheated Himself was a movie that years ago I showed it. It was a decent print. Uh, you know, we made the arrangements. It was it had no owner, so that was a little tricky. Uh, and then the, I wanted to show it again, and ten years later the film had deteriorated and couldn't be screened. So then that became a restoration project for us to save that one. And then I'm happy to say, Jan, there are movies that you know nothing about. Like I can't, I don't know to go look for it because I don't know this film. I've never heard of it. And, and that's where this fabulous network of people all around the world 
contact me and say, have you ever seen this movie? It was made in Argentina in 1952. Uh, it's fantastic. You should really try to find it. And in some cases, I use the internet because overseas, there are sites where films have been uploaded in their native language with no subtitles. And I can watch them and kind of piece it together and say, wow, this film really is great. And then you go looking for, because we restore foreign films as well. And we go looking for original materials on that. And we're, we're in the process of restoring a film made in Argentina in 1952 right now that has never been shown outside of Argentina. Wow. And it's a fabulous no film noir based on a very famous crime novel written in the late 1930s, but nobody knows about this film. And and uh, it was made, I'm not going to say the title because I'm superstitious, okay. but um, there, there was a version made from of this novel in the late 1960s that everyone thinks is the only version of the only film version of this book. And so when we do this restoration, and we'll be able to say, guess what? There was a version made 19 years earlier <laughs> wow. and nobody has yeah. seen it because it only showed in Argentina. That and is, it's excellent. That is amazing. Are you planning on showing that at the film festival? Of course. Okay, great. Not at, not at this one, not at this one because it's still a work in progress, which is my superstition. I don't like to talk right. about the the projects or name them until I know it's completed and it's successful. Because if, if we, we can always encounter some kind of huge thing like, well, we didn't know, like this project, we just discovered that every every source for this movie listed as being 95 minutes long. And then we actually got the original negative and started working with it, and it turns out to be 105 minutes long. There's 10 minutes in this version that is unaccounted for in any listing of the film anywhere. And I have to tell you that 10 minutes makes a big difference in your budget when you're trying to restore a film. So it's like, wow, we got to find some more money because we budgeted for 95 minutes, and this is actually 105 minutes. Truly interesting, really. You are a detective. You definitely are. If you're just tuning in, uh, you are listening to the Jam Price Show all about movies. And my guest today is Eddie Muller, and he is the Turner Classic Movies host of Noir Alley. And we're talking about his film festival, Noir City. Eddie, how do you decide which films you're going to show at the film festival? I try to, film programming is a bit of a science and a bit of an art. The woman who invited me to do this first at the Castro, her name is Anita Manga. She was the programmer there. And whatever I know about film programming, I have learned from Anita. And she said, you know, don't be afraid to program titles that are well known because that's going to bring, that's like the, the magnet that's going to attract people's attention because they know the film. And then you can show the obscure stuff, which is really my thing. That's what I love to do is, is show people a film that they've never seen, never even heard of. But I also try to program to a theme so that coming to the show is not just entertaining, there's also something um, illuminating about it. Uh, I, I hate to use the word educational because it's more entertaining than that. But this year we're showing all films from the 1950s. So it's called Film Noir in the 50s. And the, the festival will start in 1950. And then it, every show, everything's a double bill. And every double bill that we show, it proceeds one year. So we start in 1950 and it goes 51, 52, 53, 54. So you can actually see how Hollywood was evolving and changing during the 1950s through this specific lens of film noir and, the, and these stylish crime movies. And it's, it's fascinating because in this festival, you will see the decline of the studio system and the rise of independent filmmaking. And like right smack dab in the middle of of the film festival, Stanley Kubrick makes his, his first film in New York on location, Killer's Kiss, and then United Artists distributes it, and it's like this is a whole different look and feel for movies, and you can see how it's all changing. And uh, and then by the end, I'm actually going to show um, Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, which is his you know French New Wave version of Hollywood crime movies, you know, he, he dedicates it to monogram pictures. Uh, and, and that's just cinema changes dramatically in 1960. So you, you get this, if you come to the whole festival, you get this sort of history lesson. But if you just come once or twice to see the movies, that's fantastic too. You know, I guarantee you a good time. 
Well, on the opening night, you mentioned Trapped, um, and then the other film that it's a double bill, and you call them, uh, you know, an A A A film and a B film. So we'll, I want to talk a little bit more about that. But the second film on on that you're showing on opening night is The File on Thelma Jordan. Tell us a little bit about that, and and what the difference is between an an A movie and a B movie. Okay, well, over the years, a lot of people have assumed that a B film, that it's somewhat of a pejorative label, like, well, it's not as good as an A film, that's a B film, and they assume it has something to do with being cheesy and, you know, not quite up to snuff or something. The The reality is, is in Hollywood back then, everything was a double bill in all the theaters, and the studios had their A unit and their B unit. And the B films were genre pictures that had a smaller budget. Uh, usually the actors and the talent were up-and-coming players, and it was like a testing ground for the actors and the directors. Or else it was actors who had like were a little past their prime, maybe, and they were relegated to making B films because they were no longer in the A pictures. So, for example, that opening night show, The Final on Thelma Jordan is a Paramount A picture with Barbara Stanwyck, Wendell Corey, uh, all of the craft that Paramount could bring to bear on a big picture with a big director, Robert C. Adman who is, in my estimation, like the best director of film noir. But then Trapped was made by a much smaller studio, Eagle Lion. It's very short. B-movies are generally, they run between 65 and 80 minutes, always shorter than the A picture. You know, it was the bottom half of the double bill. So that's sort of how it works. Now, that started to fade in the 1950s because double bills were not de rigueur <laughs> by the end of the 1950s. Uh, most theaters still had them, but the, the hard, rules of A picture, B picture didn't apply as much toward the end of the 1950s. Anyway, it, it's interesting and it still applies to this day because a lot of people who come to my festival come on public transportation and they love the fact that we show a B film that's, that is shorter so they can make the train. <laughs> <laughs> Just like in the old days, right? Exactly. Eddie, can you make the second feature a little bit shorter so I can get a bus train on? So you, so you can get the train. Eddie, where can people get tickets and what is the date of New Orleans, Eddie? City 17. Okay, the festival The festival is always 10 days. Uh, this year it starts, or next year as we're speaking now, right. uh, January 25th through February 3rd at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. To get the full program, you can go online to noircity.com, N-O-I-R-C-I-T-Y, all run together, uh, noircity.com, and there will, of course, be a link to buy tickets. Uh, you can get advanced tickets uh, online, and if you're really committed, you can buy what we call the, uh, the passport. They gets you into everything and gets you advanced entrance to the theater because the crowds do get kind of big. Uh, so a passport gets you in first to every show. And, and if you buy the passport, which is everything, uh, that's essentially you're getting two free movies out of it because that's, that's how the pricing thing works. So, and, and it's, it's just sensational. It's so funny, Jan, when we started doing this, I sold the first year I started the passports, we sold 60 passports and now we sell over 400. Wow. That's amazing. So, I mean, four, 400 people, at, at least, are committing to see every wow. single movie for 10 days. That's fabulous. Which is, which is pretty great, you know. And then there's a huge walk-up business. And it's comical because people from out of town say, well, I better buy tickets in advance because I don't I don't want to miss out. And it's like, well, it is a 1,400-seat theater. O odds are you're going to get in. <laughs> right, Eddie. So, uh, everybody, go, get, go online and get your tickets to Noir City. Pleasure having you on the show. Oh. Always, Eddie. So oh, I, I really appreciate it, Jan. It's great fun talking to you always. You too. Thank you. Go to the Jam Price Show on Facebook to learn more about upcoming shows. And while you're there, please like my page. And to listen to the Price Movie Minute movie reviews and to listen to archive shows that you may have missed, go to thejampriceshow.com. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio, Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. The Yozio Theater in downtown Monterey is now open every day, showing independent and foreign films. The Yozio Theater has new concession offerings, including beer, wine, hard cider, and their homemade Lush Slush. You can now schedule private event screenings for community charity events, birthdays, anniversaries, or just a fun gathering of friends. For more information, visit the Ozio Theater online at oziotheater.com.